Revelation 17. Father God, we come before you. And it's awfully hard to teach a mystery that is not yet fully revealed. But we can look for clues. Lord, how I pray that you would take this chapter of Revelation that has two major subjects that are specially key in the last days, in particular the last seven years, before you return and establish your kingdom that will have no end. And so, Lord, I pray you would open your word today, help us to understand it, and that, Father God, it might challenge us to be salt and to be light, even among God's people, while we have time. And so, Lord, bless this time, make it clear, <clears throat> make it simple. May everyone go home, hopefully understanding more of what is coming so they can be prepared. We thank you, Lord. We praise you and ask you to open your word to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. To remind us, Revelation chapter 16, verse 10. The fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat or the thronos, throne of the beast, the Antichrist. His kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and the sore, their sores, and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And these are the kings of the east who have chafed under the rule of the Antichrist. They are now seeking to come and essentially overthrow that rule of the Antichrist. And seeing that kind of uprising coming against him, the response from Satan and the Antichrist was verse 13. They had three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, that is the devil, out of the mouth of the beast or the Antichrist, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And they are spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day or that great day of God Almighty. And again, the exhortation to God's people. But for you, behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. But they gathered them to that great day of God Almighty, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Satan and his minions are drawing the human realm into a massive battle. And if that battle wasn't interrupted, what would not survive? Jesus said, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would survive. Then the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done, or the idea, it is completed, it is finished, is what often is the idea. It has come to pass, is the best translation. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was great earthquakes, such as was not since men were on the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, believe again, Jerusalem, and the cities of the nations fell, talked about it last week, and great Babylon, who we're going to learn about today, came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. And of course, what ought to follow next is chapter 19, verse 11, which is, I saw heaven open. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. That's where we ended up. Now, to, to sum up thus far what we've had happen, we had the fifth bowl, or vial, which plunged the Antichrist, in particular his throne, his kingdom, into darkness, and the idea it's coming under judgment. We had the sixth bowl, which was the way of the Euphrates being dried up, and there was this uprising coming against the Antichrist, which caused Satan and those two minions, Antichrist and false prophet, to respond by going out and deceiving the nations to come and fight. And they're going to be deceived one more time as Christ returns, and that is they're going to be deceived to turn and try to fight God. Kind of makes you wonder if that is what the lie is of the strong delusion. That you can fight God and win. 
And then we saw the seventh bowl poured out, or vial. And it was poured out as we studied last week into the air. And we were learning from the scripture, he's the prince of the power of the air, he's the god of this age who has blinded the hearts and the minds. And so there came this final judgment against the, the realm in the sense of the very authority of Satan's realm, it appears. And I wonder as that happens, did that begin to plunge the principalities and powers into their own confusion? But as all this is happening, the end result is going to be, verse 19, chapter 16, great Babylon is going to fall. The Lord is going to return and he's going to establish his kingdom. So now that great Babylon has been mentioned to us, John takes a side journey here that goes from chapter 17 to chapter 19, verse 10. And he's going to describe to us the things that are going on in judging this system, which has really two components to it. So in chapter 17, we have two major subjects we're going to talk about. One is the woman, and we'll get to her in a minute. The second is the beast, which you know from chapter 13, the Antichrist, and how these two interact during this final seven-year period of history to deceive the nations, to lead them away from God, and to bring them to a false system of worship. Is everybody still with me? What are our two subjects? Woman? Woman? And beast. Antichrist beast. Okay, good. So far, so good. The reason why I'm going to be very deliberate is because this chapter, when you consider it, has some very sobering implications. So we need to understand it clearly, as best we can, on this side of it happening. Prophecy is prehistory. It's something before it happens. It's so easy to see it with 2020 vision once it has happened. So we're going to do the best we can. And what I get wrong, you'll make fun of me in heaven forever, and I'll deal with it. So now context. Context is very important. There came one of the seven angels, chapter 17, verse 1, which had the seven vials, or bowls, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now, I want to point out something very obvious. The church of Jesus Christ is called the bride of Christ. How many understand the bride of Christ is quite different than the great whore? How many? One of these things is not like the other. One of these things is not quite the same. So how did we get here? Ah, good. Turn to Revelation 3. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, there was the seventh church that was being admonished. And he said, as many as I love, verse 19, chapter 3, Revelation, I rebuke. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. So be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Now he's speaking to a church, but you could apply it to your own heart. The Lord has spent for you your lifetime knocking. And you may be here and you do not yet have a saving relationship with Christ. You have not yet surrendered your life to him, but you're here because weird stuff's going on in the world around you. And you want to see what's going on among God's people. And we just happen to be in the book of Revelation, which we did not plan, but somebody did. The idea that things are convicting you that you've done in the past, the guilt and the shame is beginning to get overwhelming. That's God knocking. That's God knocking through the Holy Spirit. One artist rendition of this is a picture of Christ knocking at a door, and on the outside of the door, there is no doorknob, which means, how does he get in? Someone from the inside must open to him, assuming that they are actually hearing him knock. And so to the church, the church has put him on the outside. And it's a sign of the church in the last days, just before, as we look through this in a minute, the church is suddenly removed. Christ is on the outside, seeking to get back in the midst of his church. In other words, they're focusing somewhere else. But it's also an, an interesting application to the individual, and that is I can look back and see where he was knocking in 1989 on my heart, and it took me till about you know, October to, to answer. It took me 10 months. I'm, I'm you know... Only took 10 months. Thank God he didn't stop. So first of all, we learn something very important. To him that opens, if you open your heart this morning to Christ, 
I will come in and sup. I will fellowship with you. I will have relationship with you. The idea is acceptance and blessing. To him that overcometh, verse 21, <clears throat> chapter 3, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto whom? Churches, ecclesia, called out ones, the ecclesia. From chapter 1 to chapter 3, verse 22, that word has been used 19 times. 19 times we hear about the churches, the churches, the churches, the called out ones, the called out ones, the churches. And then suddenly after verse 22 here, it disappears. And we don't hear the word the churches again until the last chapter, Revelation 22, 16. It's almost like after this, the church is gone on the earth. That's important. And just in case we're not sure about that, look at Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, when he had taken the book, verse 8, the four creatures, living creatures, and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, every one of them having harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. In Revelation 5, 9, they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us, and we went all through this when we were there, redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Here is the church in the presence of Jesus Christ singing his praise as he takes the scroll from the Father and has yet to break a seal. Well, how do you know it's a church? Very simple. Look back at Revelation 1. Revelation 1, verse 4. John to the seven churches, which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, who was he writing to? The churches. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Help me, church. Amen. Amen. So in Revelation 5, you have the target audience of this book, the church, in the presence of Jesus Christ, singing his praise. And then he breaks the first seal. Chapter 6. And when he broke the first seal, that began the rise of the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is identified by making what for seven years? Okay, so let's slow down and consider it. When the Antichrist makes his peace agreement, based on how this book is laying out the, the direction here to us, where is the church? So when that peace agreement starts, it runs for seven years. Halfway through, he's going to upend that agreement and demand the Antichrist to be worshipped as God. Everybody still with me? Okay. Why is this important? Because chapter 17 is picking up what has happened with the religious system during that seven years where the true church has left and has left behind buildings, wealth, political influence, and basically the opportunity to take over. How many are following me? We are looking at what is the remnant of the churches around the world having had the true believers removed and suddenly the believers who are left, you know, you come to church on a Sunday and nothing's set up and no one's here and the coffee's not working and all that. And you're like, oh, they're totally slacking. <laughs> Maybe you were. The church is going to suddenly disappear. Throughout scripture, we talked about it. So the context we have is, back to chapter 17, the context we have is, in the absence of the true believing church who knew Christ as their savior, there was left behind a shell or a remnant of the buildings and the organizational structure and the political influence and the, you know, the schools and the orphanages and all the other things all around the world are suddenly up for grabs. So chapter 17, 
there came one of the seven angels which had seven vials, or had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show you the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Okay, we can solve many waters first of all. Look at verse 15. He saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, verse 17, 15, where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes, nations and tongues. First question, what is the effective reach of this harlot system? The whole world. And it may well be that with the signing of this peace agreement and suddenly the empty shell of what has been the church and those who are left behind, it may be we will see just an incredible ecumenical movement, so-called, where all the churches just start getting together, bust out sing kumbaya, and here they are, they're part of this system. When will we know for sure? When it happens. Who wants to be here? Yeah, me neither. Okay. So here we go. We have what was the structure, the influence, and the power, and sadly, some of the players still here of that system. So she sits upon many waters, verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. That had to be pretty shocking to John because in 90 AD, John is sitting on the Isle of Patmos, as you know, as essentially an exile under punishment because he had been, according to tradition, boiled in oil, tortured, survived it. And so he was sent by Domitian to the island of Patmos where he was put to hard labor, as far as we understand, because of his faith in Christ. At his time, the church has virtually zero political power. And so for him to see this great whore, this system, and this system has become not only global, but this system has reached a point where it actually influences and essentially is dominating and, and being very much involved in politics. He's sitting there watching going, oh my goodness, this thing has been involved in, in rising of kings and making kings and instructing kings, and it must have blown his mind. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now, if you've been with us, you keep hearing a statement, they that dwell upon the earth. How many remember it? They that dwell upon the earth. It's used 11 times, and this is our 10th of 11 uses. And this 10th use, again, the inhabitants, same thing as translated dwellers. These always refer to the unbelievers. And so with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth or the unbelievers have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. They are being deceived by this system. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw the woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Okay, next thing. Verse 3, carried me away in the spirit to show him something. Interesting, carried me away to the wilderness. I, you know, I spent the week looking and praying and thinking about, why the wilderness? If you were looking for fruit, would you go out to the wilderness? Interesting, it seems to almost speak of the system as anything but fruitful took me out to the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast. Interesting, it is a woman that is chosen. Think back to how Satan brought the whole creation into sin in the first place. Interesting depiction. Deception. Seduction. A woman sit on a scarlet covered Therion, same word used of the Antichrist in chapter 13. But just to make sure we know what we're talking about, scarlet covered beast, that scarlet covered, scarlet covered beast is full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Let's turn back to chapter 13, verse 1 of Revelation, just to review. Chapter 13, verse 1, I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up, Therion, out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. Okay, back to chapter 17. This false religious system is going to arrive on the back of the Antichrist. How many get the metaphor? In other words, with his rise to power, he's going to grab this system, and he's going to use it for his own ends and his own, his own means, his own reasoning here. He's got an objective as to why he's allowing this thing to ride into the scene with him. And so this woman sits upon essentially the system of this Antichrist, this final beast. 
full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple. Who wore purple in the days of John? The Roman politically connected, Roman class, the royalty. Lydia was a seller of purple. Purple and scarlet come from two things, one from the, the blood, kind of this, this stuff from worms, the other from the muric shell, both very expensive. And of course, when it's expensive, it tells everybody that you have cash. And so they like to wear purple. Something I've been noticing since 2015, and I'll just tip you off to it. Normally, when you see in this political season people of different parties, you'll see a blue tie or a red tie. But if you're paying attention, there are people starting to wear purple. Maybe you haven't seen it, but it's caught my eye as soon as it started showing up in 2015. There's a group of people wearing purple. Keep your eye out for it, because it, you almost wonder, like, is that? But just pointing it out. Just, sorry, everything I see, I see through this, because I spend all day in this, right? So when I see them, like, wait a minute, what are they doing in purple? And these are the movers and the shakers. You kind of go, hmm, purple, first color. Second color, scarlet color. Okay, time out. Where is the church, the true church, as this is happening? Hands. I want to see it with hands. Where is the true church when this is happening? Everybody with me? Okay, here are some challenges. One, Google who wears scarlet. Just try it. I tried it throughout the weeks. I tried it again. Looked at it even, you know, last night, late. Google, who wears, it doesn't matter which, which platform you use. I use Chrome, tried a couple. Who wears scarlet? The first link that comes up will surprise you. And if you click on that link, the photo will be pretty surprising as well. If you have what I have, it's clean. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying when you ask the World Wide Web who wears scarlet, they give you a specific group of people right now in the religious community. Surprising. Remember, but this is after the true church is removed, the shell is left with some key players possibly there who said they knew about Christ, but did not truly believe in Christ, maybe even heard them knocking, but left them on the outside. Jesus takes his church home, and here these people are still connected, perhaps even have position, and they consolidate power. How many understand me? Okay. So there was a scarlet colored woman with purple and scarlet, that's how she's arrayed. Verse four, she's decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, interesting again, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations. The idea is a foul odor or something disgusting or abhorrent, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Here's another interesting thing to Google. Google having a golden cup in their hand you'll be interested to see what comes up in the first set of images. So think of the church, the true church has been removed. And I will tell you, I have encountered born again believers in virtually every permutation of the church you can think of. And praise God, I find them. I find them among denominations. I find them among those who used to have a name and no longer have it. I find them among those who have some conflicting doctrines, but you know what? They know Christ paid for them and they believe Jesus is the savior and they're born again. I see them, I meet them. And when he pulls out that true remnant from among the visible church around the world, there is going to be a system that is going to get consolidated, it is going to be global, and it is going to be used absolutely by the Antichrist for his own ends. Interesting things to see. So her hand is full of a cup, a golden cup of abominations and filthiness. Verse 5, and upon her forehead, she's identified by this, was a name written, Mystery now, a mystery in the Bible, if you've been with us, is not something that cannot be known. It's something that is now finally being revealed, okay? And so the mystery of the gospel, if you go back through the Old Testament, you'll see there were many who trusted God by faith. You could see that the Jews and the Gentiles would all eventually be the flock of God. It's throughout the Old Testament, not just in the New, but it was a mystery that had been hidden, that the Son of God would come and would die, and the Jews would struggle. How can he suffer? But he reigns forever, and they were missing the key, that first the Christ suffers, then he enters into his glory. These things were there, but you just it had to take time to reveal it. So now we have this mystery. It is Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. First things first, the mystery is something being revealed, but we, if we paid attention, we could see that it was already going on at a small level. What do you mean? Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. There are a number of places I could go in the New Testament, but I'm going to just let Paul talk to us. 
Paul is, if you can imagine, having to defend his apostleship to the Corinthians, who were in darkness till he came and shared with them. But he's saying to them, are they ministers of Christ? Verse 23, I speak as a fool, well, then I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often. Of the Jews, five times, verse 24, 2 Corinthians 11, of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Five times he received 39 lashes. Thrice was I beaten with rods, which is a great way to break your ribs. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and the day have I been in the deep. Look at this. In journeyings, often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, and perils by the heathen, and perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea, here we go, and perils among false brethren. False brethren. Pseudo, the idea, pseudo apostles or pseudo, essentially pseudo um, disciples or pseudo Adelphi, pseudo brothers, false brethren. Interesting. Take a look, if you would, also at Acts chapter 20, further left. Acts chapter 20, Paul, talking to the Ephesian elders, <clears throat> didn't have a lot of time to visit everybody, so he had them meet him at Miletus. And he said to him, verse 28, take heed, Acts 20, 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of God, don't miss this, which he, God, has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock, even of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. False brethren. Well, I don't know. That's kind of stretching. Okay, Matthew 13, further left. Matthew 13. Matthew 13 is the section on parables. Jesus teaching them, and parables are interesting because you have to be careful and deliberate in how you interpret them, but some of them are pretty clear. And so we have two parables that are of interest to us right now. Chapter 13, verse 31. Another parable put Jesus forth unto him, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed. How many have heard this? Okay, very good. Which, is, which a man took and sowed in his field, the field was the world, which indeed is the least of all seeds, at least there in the Middle East, one of the smallest they knew. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among the herbs and becometh the tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Oh, that's such a great picture. The church is going to start small, 12 guys, 11 actually, 11 guys, and then it's going to grow and it's going to have these many branches and it's going to, oh, it's wonderful. And little birdies come and they rest. In the, wow, it's fantastic. It is until you know how to interpret parables. Remember the parable of the sower, a man went forth sowing seed, and some seed fell upon the, bat, the path, and the birds came and snatched away the seed, and then they brought Jesus, you know, eventually into the house there, and they, they came and said, would you please explain it to us? And he said, those who hear the word of God are like the ones, those on the path are those who hear the word of God, and before it can take root in their heart, the devil comes and steals that seed away, blinds the hearts and the minds, last week's chapter, lest they believe the glorious gospel. So when Jesus is expounding parables to us, he tells us when you encounter birds in a parable, especially one he's teaching, it speaks of satanic activity. So let's think about it. The kingdom of heaven is going to start small, 11 people. It is going to grow into a massive reaching, you know, essentially living thing, so to speak, plant. It's going to have many branches. Today we call them denominations. And Satan, near the end of its growth, is going to infiltrate and influence some of those branches. I know that sounds far-fetched. Or is it? And what happens in this mystery Babylon? Satan takes what was the church, after the true church has been removed, takes over its branches and uses it now with the Antichrist to deceive the world. How many are following me? Because if you're going to have an antichrist, the best thing to use to bring people to it is what was Christ's church. But now the church is gone, the true church. Interesting. And it doubles down on that idea in verse 33. Another parable spake ye unto him. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven. What is leaven a type of? Almost always a type of sin. 
the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, like unto leaven, which a woman, interesting, took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Now the optimist would say, oh, that's great. The gospel is going to go in. It's going to reach the entire world and it's going to be wonderful and wood to God. But the other valid translation is the kingdom of heaven is like the church is going to get leaven brought into it that sadly near the end of its time is going to be almost completely corrupt. Okay, back to Revelation 17. There came one of the seven angels which had seven vials, talked with me and said, come hither and I will show to you the judgment of the great whore, a religious system that is opposed to Christ, that is deceiving nations around the world, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. The inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication, again, misleading them away from God. He carried me in the spirit to the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, the Antichrist. She rides in on his system, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads, ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was written the name, Mystery, now revealed, a false church. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. This thing's rooted in Babylon. Ooh, are we run out of time. Ah, let's keep going. All right, so Genesis chapter 10, left turn Genesis. We're going we're gonna to condense. Genesis chapter 10, Babylon. What's the deal? Where's it from? What's its influence? Okay. Isn't that amazing to understand Revelation? You've got to go to Genesis. It's like it's one book. Thousands of years apart, 1,400 years at least apart. So in Genesis chapter 10, verse 6, this is after Noah and his three sons and their wives left the ark. He had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Very good. Well, let's follow the line of Ham. Verse 6, the sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, and Foot, and Canaan. The sons of Cush, Sheba, and Havilah, and Sabta, and Rama, and Sabteca, or Sabteca, you try it. And sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan. Cush begot Nimrod. Nimrod began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. There's some references, according to historians among the Assyrian records, to this effect. And note this in verse 10. In the beginning of his kingdom, this appears to be the first attempt or the first founder to attempt to establish an empire. His kingdom was at where? Babel. Or Babel, or Babel, depending how you want to say it and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna, and the land of Shinar. And out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh, these cities coming out of Nimrod. Nineveh, which we talked a lot about on Wednesday nights. Babel. Okay, we're well, fine. Good. Chapter 11, verse 1. The whole earth, Genesis, was of one language. Chapter 11, verse 1, Genesis. Flip the page. The whole earth was of one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Some argue this is northern Tigris Euphrates near the Sinjar Mountains. That's the opinion of some. Others say no, it's down closer to the area of Babylon proper. When will we know for sure? When either the archaeologists get it straightened out or God tells us. But it's in the same region of Tigris and Euphrates, still in Mesopotamia. So they came to the plan of Sharnar. <clears throat> they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brook for stone and slime for the mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make a name lest we be scattered. Now, when Noah came off the ark, he was told to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. They don't want to follow God's direction. Let's make a tower. Let's reach unto heaven. Let's do our own thing is the idea. And the Lord came down, not that he didn't know, but this is often how he does judgment. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they have begun to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. And nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us, plural, go down, singular. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. 
and confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore, the name of it is called Babel, which means confusion from the Hebrew, because the Lord there did confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. And interestingly enough, after the flood is where we think most of the mountains and other things came from, which also helped to separate them and slow them down. Babel, interesting, can mean confusion. Bab-il, according to Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, can also mean gateway to God. Interesting, Bab-el, others say, E-L, gateway to God. Bab-ilion, from Answers in Genesis, gate of the gods. So what we have is we have men, through their efforts, trying to work their way to the gods. What is religion? Religion is you having to do something to get right with God. What is salvation? Salvation is God, having come down to die for you, offers you forgiveness. One is based on man, and you will never reach. The other is based on God, and he's been knocking, and all you got to do is say, here I am. Totally different system. So this system of Babel or Babylon is, again, man-made religion, essentially, man-made rules seeking to attain something, but yet will come up horribly short and deceived. So back to Revelation. Mystery, going to be revealed. Babylon the Great. How many have ever seen the Know Your Enemy series? Okay, if you haven't, Google Know Your Enemy Fuel Project. A lot of good stuff in it. You take the meat, spit out the bones. But they have 77 parts. 77. You will lose two days. Two days, because you won't be able to stop. It will show you how Mystery Babylon has worked from this time of the area of Mesopotamia, even to the present day in its occult influence. You'll see it. This has been around a long time. The mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And so verse 6, John goes on, I saw the woman, this religious system, drunken with the blood of the saints. You see, this mystery is now fully revealed, but there have been those who are opposed to God, who have persecuted those of God, who have preached the narrow way, the truth of salvation in Christ. And once again, if you know church history, we've seen little hints of whether it was Catholic against Protestant or Protestant against Catholic. You saw different times where the church got taken over, deceived, and began to do ungodly things. Those are all foretastes of what's coming ultimately in this system when God's people are out and the shell is left behind and this thing suddenly has global reach empowered by the Antichrist. It's going to be an absolutely horrible thing to see, let alone live through. I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. This will be especially during the tribulation. Those who refuse the mark, refuse to worship the Antichrist, take the number of his name, they're going to find some of the biggest persecution they receive is coming from this false religious system. With the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. He was wondering the ideas with great wonder. And the angel said to me, wherefore didst thou marvel? John's sitting there watching and he's going, what happened to the church? Well, number one, it got removed. And then Satan grabbed it through this antichrist, threw it in with his program and used it to deceive the nations to bring them ultimately to worship the antichrist who tried to bring them to worship the devil himself. You see, if you won't receive Christ now while we're still in the acceptable year of the Lord, what's coming is a strong delusion. There's going to be a form of godliness, so to speak. There's going to be some kind of religious system, but it's not going to bring you to the way, the truth, and the life. It's going to bring you down into destruction. That's coming. And God's warned us. So why did you marvel? Because you couldn't believe what had happened. The angel said unto me, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman. Okay, two subjects. And of the beast that carried her. So I will tell you about the false religious system and the Antichrist and his governmental authority. What was the subject of our chapter? These two things. Okay, wonderful. Let's try to finish up the mystery of the woman. Interesting. Verse 9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. In other words, tie on your thinking caps. Kindergarten all over again. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. You will find this system headquartered in a place that has seven hills, seven mountains. Okay, that's interesting. 
You will learn again in verse 15, the waters which thou sawest where the whore sits, this religious system, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So though it is based in an area that has seven mountains where it's located, its influence yet will be global. Verse 16, the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these are ten kings as we know, they shall hate the whore, the religious system, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast. So they will tolerate this system for a period of time, but when it is finished serving its purpose, it is going to be turned against or turned upon and taken down. Unto the words of God shall be fulfilled. They will do these things. And then verse 18, here comes the real interesting curveball. And the woman, this false religious system which thou sawest, is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Very simple question. In 90 AD, what city was that? Rome. What is Rome built upon? Seven hills. Now hear me carefully. The system that is going to rise appears to be headquartered in Rome, wears scarlet and purple, has a global reach, and is preaching anything but the true gospel. That's what's coming. That comes when the church has been what? Removed. Does everybody understand me? You are seeing a godless system of goats that have been left behind. And once that takes root, it is going to be used to deceive the world. And it is going to be powerful, it is going to be sobering, and it is going to happen. But we got to deal with that beast too. Verse 8. The beast which thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. What does that mean? It means we're out of time. We're never going to be able to get that now. Get that next week. Let's stand and pray. Well, that was easy, right? Dear church, I reserve the right to be wrong. But I'll tell you what, whatever this thing is, it's a mess. And it's going to lead people away from Jesus. If you're sitting here thinking, well, I'll wait till I come back and this place is empty and then I'll get saved. I wholeheartedly encourage you not to wait. Whether you're here or listening. Maybe you're tuning in because you're wondering what's going on. God has allowed you to know that he sent his son to die for you. You don't need religion. You need a relationship. And that relationship comes when you receive the Son of God into your heart by faith. That's when your life will actually begin. Father, we thank you for your word. And we pray, Lord, for anyone here or anyone listening that doesn't know you. May they sense your knocking on the heart. Or as we learned last week, as the light of God begins to shine into their hearts, let them not turn to darkness, but let them turn in repentance to you. Repentance toward God whom they've sinned against. And faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who has paid for them. Lord, how I pray that you would take this strange season we are in and use it to call people while there is time. Lord, what strange days are ahead, and thank you so much. To be absent from the body, we will be present with the Lord. We look forward to those days, Lord. And we look forward to hearing suddenly the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and the Lord himself shouting, come up hither. Thank you for these things, Lord. Strengthen us this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.